Okay, uh, so uh, uh, my brief was to uh, um, start some sort of uh, I don't know, provocative discussion on ads -CFT. Um And of course, all of us know everything about all the things that are known about ads -CFT. So uh, uh, what I thought I would do in this, uh, in this extremely informal sort of presentation is to uh, motivate and bring up a set of questions uh, that I would like to know the answers to about ADS-CFT. Um, as you know, whenever you have these questions about something session, there are two extremes that you don't want to fall into, right? <laughs> uh, extreme number one is to ask deep questions that nobody has any hope of answering. <laughs> that's, the easy, that's the easy route. Uh, 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 extreme number two is to ask questions that somebody will answer on the spot. <laughs> I, I, I will veer towards the second extreme. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so, okay. So let, let me, so let me start. So I've organized my questions around, uh, uh, you know, a set of themes. One of, one major theme it turned out, I didn't do the organization on purpose, but when I, I looked at my questions later on. The other one of the major themes has to do with n. Okay, so n being large, n being finite, many questions about n. So, uh, questions about n. And then the other, um, uh, the other, the other, the other questions. Um, are about excitations, about, I don't know, the, the, the stuff people talk about in this it from qubit kind of community, and uh, about generalizations. As I said, I would try to keep up my questions as down to earth as possible, and it's very possible that some of you know all of you know, you know the answer to some, some extent of some of these questions, that would be wonderful. Okay. Okay, so let me start. I will start with this this group of questions. Okay. So the first comment I want to make here um, is about S matrices. Okay. So let's look at, let's suppose we're studying uh, S matrices S matrices and flat space. Perhaps in strict. Okay. Um, now, at least traditionally, the, the most traditional view on S matrices is S matrices are amplitudes to go from the past to the future for, for particles that are infinitely stable. They're particles that live forever. So they can be prepared as asymptotic states, they can be measured as asymptotic states, and you study them. At least traditionally, that is the view for what an S matrix is. Okay? So now we apply this traditional view to uh, string theory. We see a sort of big disconnect between what we get in classical string theory and what we get in quantum string theory. Because in classical string theory, we have a huge bunch of observables, namely S matrices for all of the exponential, exponentially many particles of string theory. Right? These are all stable particles in classical string theory. And at least, perturbatively, at least in classical string theory, we can compute all their S Oh, these are well-defined observables. Quite mechanically, most of these S matrices, most of these particles will decay. Almost all of them can be very exceptional other than the massless particles defined stable. BPS. Other massless particles are BPS. BPS excitation, maybe some non-BPS strains, yeah, but they'll be very exceptional. Uh, guys here that, that remain stable. So, in string, theory, in string theory, if we are conservative people, we would say that the set of observables of classical string theory is much, much smaller, uh, sorry, much, much larger than quantum string theory. Right? We could say the same in quantum field theory. We could say the same in quantum field theory. 
But in quantum field theory, we've got many more examples. We've got correlation functions of operators at finite distances, and those remain sort of the same in the classical and the quantum theory. Okay? Uh, this becomes more dramatic in string theory because, again, if we're very conservative, these look like the only observables of string theory, these S matrices. So the set of S matrices support dramatically decreases. If we're being very conservative, we come back. Okay, any violent objections to this point? So, so you're doing non perturbative string theory. If you look perturbatively, there's no problem, right? Well, if you look perturbatively, there is no problem, but even perturbatively, you would find that all these particles develop an imaginary mass. Okay, and then you would have to ask yourself if it's okay to sit on the poles of these guys with imaginary masses. And so, certainly non perturbatively, it's darkest, but even in perturbation theory, you might get violent. Um, I, but, of course, these are questions. So that, that. Okay? Fine. Now, so this is just a, I mean, a hopefully non-controversial <coughs> comment about, about classical string, the uh, string theory in classics. Uh, what is this to do with area safety? Well, as all of us know, and, uh, some of us know better than others. Short term is very well. <laughs> okay. Uh, the the uh, um, the uh, sorry, Shaw. Um, <laughs> the uh, the the thing we compute in ADS safety, namely uh, partition function as function of boundary values, is a very close analog of the classical of the S matrix. Of flat space. Okay, so now you might wonder. Uh, you might wonder what happens to this observation when translated to ADS CFT. Okay, so let's look at this question for two minutes. Um, let us remind ourselves that suppose we have an ADS. Okay, so so let us remind. Uh, let, uh, suppose we have an ADS, and we take. We're working first classically. We take, I don't know, some string field theory, put it in ADS. And we take all the fields of the theory and diagonalize the quadratic parts of that theory. Okay? So we diagonalize the <coughs> quad part. Okay? We get particles with real masses. And uh, as all of you know, there's a one to one correspondence between free wave equations in ADS and unitary representations of the S of V comma 2 conformal group. So it's one-to-one -one correspondence between these, these free wave equations and operators in the conformal field. Okay? All very good. Okay, let's suppose we start with the quantum theory. Now this quadratic, quadratic effective action would become funny. For instance, particles could pick up imaginary masses. Okay. Uh, this is the direct analog of the instability of the particle in, in, in flat space. And so now if we try to make a one-to-one -one correspondence between these wave equations and operators in the quantum field theory, it wouldn't work. Uh, you know, the map would take you to, the, to scaling dimensions that would have imaginary parts. We don't expect operators in a finite and quantum field theory to have imaginary dimensions. Okay? So, now, the traditional ADS CFT map seems to me becomes confusing. If we're computing action as a function of boundary values of these guys, which you let's say, imaginary masses, unstable, um, why are we computing on the quantum field theory side? Okay? Now, of course, on the quantum field theory side, we expect, we expect uh, that the observables are clean and they're there. And part of the problem, of course, is that you know, at finite n, the single trace operators will start mixing with double trace operators. Okay, that's the analog of the particles becoming unstable in flat space because the particle breaks up into two or three or four. Or four. Okay, and so the things that you would have to compute if you wanted to compute the correlation functions of, of uh, primary operators in quantum field theory would be somehow not the single field states. Okay, so this leads me, so, so now, now that I've set it up, I'm going to just write down my question. My question is. Um, uh, 
you know, of these higher guys. This, I'm going to call them non-BPS, but you know what I mean. Not, not the operators due to the gravity ones in the park. Anything else? And the subpart of this question is, once we have succeeded in figure out, figuring out the answer to this question, and I'm sure we should be able to, uh, what uh, what do these observables become in flat space? In the flat space. Does it teach us that there are new interesting observables of string theory in flat space? Uh, something that is, you know, the analog of scattered in these unstable particles, maybe sitting on the sitting on the poles with imaginary parts or something like that, uh, that uh, we could also compute in flat space. So to, since we are pretty sure that these observables are good observables in, in the boundary theory, when we do ADS CFT, there should be some way of computing them using the bulk. Once we've computed them, we take the flat space limit and enlarge our set of observables in flat space string theory to, to, to get a lesson out of this. Okay, uh, that's it for question number one. Please uh, come, come up, please tell me why it's ridiculous if I know the answer and why it's imposed. What's the definition of flat space limit? Yeah, what's the definition of flat space, space limit? Yeah. You know, I'm embarrassed in front of so many experts, but let me tell you. Uh, okay, uh, so flat space limit really is simply Taking ADS radius to infinity, keeping G string fixed. But you keep the, you want Minkowski space as your final end? You want 10 dimensional Minkowski space? Yes. But I'm taking the ADS radius to infinity, so I've got a large, I've got a large elevator of Minkowski space, and I can make that as large as I want. So anything you want to know about flat space, uh, and I keep G string fixed. So I'm not doing a traditional coefficient. Um, I'm taking n to infinity, I fix G string. Okay? Mm -hmm. Will you get a Poincaré invariant theory? Oh, you will in your elevator. Right? Because the radius of ADS is becoming as large as you want. So you fix your elevator, your Einsteinian elevator, you can make it 10,000 light years. It's in there, and it's in the limit of the Poincaré there. Now, you will have to, do, you have to do some work to make sure that the physics of that elevator is not contaminated by the other. But, you know, various experts have done this work, so it's possible, right? So uh, could it be that uh, some of these uh, become, uh, in flat space it's difficult to think of other observables than S matrix, which are asymptotic at least. Uh, is it that some of these could become singular in that limit, uh, the ones which are, are, um, uh, are trivial or something? Uh, it's possible. My feeling is that it would be near, you know, that there's this thing that I never completely understood, but people who study um, scattering somehow give great meaning to the poles of the real axis. You know, poles of the real axis are physical particles. Poles of the, of the real axis, when I was an undergraduate, I thought of them as just some crude approximation to decaying particles. But often I go to talks where people somehow take these poles of the real axis very seriously. Uh, suppose there is, there is a reason to do this. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> names we mentioned. <laughs> okay. uh, no. Yeah, yeah. But suppose there is a good reason to do this. You know, some analytic business, right? Suppose there was a pole on the real axis, and poles can't disappear. Then maybe factoring on these imaginary poles somehow is a way to find observable. And then physically, what it means at a technical level. And then physically, what it means you have to think about it, make make sense of the, it. The difficulty is unitarity, right? The difficulty is unitarity, but then you're not. Thinking of a, of this as being literally a transition amplitude. It's, a, it's an observable and you have to give it a physical interpretation. Not that I know what I'm talking about. Just, just feel that if, these, if there's a precisely defined feature in the S matrix, maybe the pole is an exact feature. Not some bright approximation or something. It's just an exact feature. 
then they might well be absorbing the residue or of something that, else. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we may have to do some work to understand what it means physically. But it may be a technically well-defined object whose physics we will one day understand. Sounds similar to this, in the sense that it sounds like if you, your, your primary operator was trace O plus trace O square, and if you're doing this calculation, it looks like you're working not with the primary operator, but you're working with trace O. It feels a little bit like, like working on the real axis when you're... Yeah. If you start from ADS, yes. I mean, you are in this box, and there are many, there are many operators. It's more like the states in ADS are really the physical states, so it's more like the bright Wigner that you're really seeing. You're just seeing some discretization of this big bump. There's many two-particle states that, that you can use to scatter there. It, it doesn't look like going to the pole to me. It doesn't look like going to the pole. I'm not so sure about that. I mean, I, I was thinking that if we, st if we stay with, let's say, the trace guy, you're scattering the guy whose wave equation has the imaginary mass. But this is some uh, perturbator, some analytic computation, right? It's not because at the non-perturbative level, there is not even a distinction. There is a some set of operators. Right, 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 right. Uh, perhaps this goes into the question of field redefinitions. I mean, I was thinking, just imagine that you've got some quantum effective action. Okay, in the bulk, whatever this is whatever this means, we take the quantum effective action and look at it quadratically and diagonalize it. <coughs> okay. That quantum effective action, if, the, if we take these imaginary poles seriously, you might have a quantum effective action, but not with, uh, uh, not with the real dimensions. And then this then began to feel to me a little bit like working on these imaginary poles. But of course, there's big distance between these words and doing anything. But, yeah, okay. yes. Um, no, at, in the free Young Mills theory, yes. you can exactly diagonalize. I mean, you know a basis which, uh, at finite end, uh, namely some sure basis or something which diagonalizes the uh, single trace, multi trace mixing. Uh, uh, ah. Right? Yes. So you know what is on the gauge theory side, you know what is the, this thing, uh, what is the set of states that are orthogonal and. Uh, but that doesn't somehow seem to be related to this yeah. uh, uh, to to this problem of the in the free, the free angle theory. There's such huge degeneracies. Yeah, there's but huge degeneracies. Any scheme you choose is a bit convention a bit. You, you need something more physical. Somehow I feel the attractions are very important, right? Because these uh, this yeah. scattering thing would not. Right, but you can imagine, I mean, then you're perturbing in lambda, you can imagine for small lambda. Yeah, so if you could imagine, if you could do it there, that would be very interesting. So, so suppose... That can't, I mean, you have, okay, the mixing problem, I don't know, uh, others will talk about it, uh, the mixing problem, uh, small lambda, you, uh, I mean, for arbitrary... Right, so you, let's say you find an eigenbasis. Let's say you're able to diagonalize the set of operators, okay? So we know what your primaries are. Now the question is what? What do you do in the bulk to calculate the correlators of those rays? Okay, it doesn't feel exactly like computing action as a function of. There are many layers to this question. One, one question, of course, has to do with field definitions. Um, when I say action as a function of boundary values, or integral as a function of boundary values of fields, I need to be able to specify what my fields are. And they're all the standard things, right? If you do local field redefinitions in AES, um, that only changes contact terms on, in correlators. If you do local field redefinitions at flat space, it doesn't change the pole part of the S matrix. It changes other things, but it doesn't. Uh, so here, in the question of what field redefinitions are, okay, uh, are allowed will get, get confusing. Uh, Mr. Ress, I'm not sure if you get the imaginary part, imaginary mass in the ADS computation. In ADS, if you carefully diagonalize everything, you always get real mass. And I, and I know one example in which, like, uh, after taking the flat space limit, you get the uh, resonance. Mm -hmm. But in that example, if you work in a finite ADS radius, you just all, you always see real masses. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that uh, if you take the flat space limit, then like a series of double trace poles, 
uh, well, a series of double trace operators that creates a branch cut. And suppose you had, like, addition, in addition to the double trace operator, you had some single trace which couples the double trace, which is like, a, which is basically a decaying particle. Then, uh, if you take that limit uh, and uh, second sheet, and then like uh, view it from like slightly away from this like a uh, line, then yeah. like uh, in the flat space but limit, the have function a function sheet. can be approximated by, uh, yeah, by a function with a branch cut with a pole on the second sheet. Uh, okay, let me understand. So suppose I have my uh, my ADS space and I take yeah. some rigid. Yeah. Now I just in the bulk. Yeah. I work out the quantum effective action for uh, for some field. Mm -hmm. Since this quantum effective action, you know, in doing that I integrate out such loops, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that will allow this particle to decay. This will develop imaginary parts of the quantum effective action. How right, can that right. but, but, the, but in ADS, when particle decays, but because of ADS like wall, it comes back. So, so it never like a decays in like a decays like infinite time. So it comes <laughs> back and then re like a, like a becomes again like a single particle. Mm. It's just like coupling the two particle states with a single particle state. So it's really just a mix. Mixes, mixes yeah. and, but the number of states. But I mean, I'm not sure we are answering in your way of thinking this quantum effective yeah. action. Right? If you, right, but if you just compute the spectrum or any observable, I, I agree with Shota. You just see operators with real dimensions. This, 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 of course, I, I agree. But I was thinking the following, that if I computed the um, uh, quantum effective action in the bulk, um, you say that I will not see, um, you say that, okay, you say that I will see a bunch of poles instead of a cut. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine. <coughs> see a bunch of poles instead of a, uh, instead of a cut. And therefore, you say, because it's a bunch of poles, you never see quite an imaginary part. Right, right, right. I see. And it comes only in the strict. Yeah, in the strict limit, yeah. Uh, maybe that's okay. Maybe when you factorize on these poles, which are kind of two particles. Two particles. Yes. Yes. It's like factorizing on a little bit of the cut of the S-matrix in flat space. Not on the on the pole, on the pole the downstairs. Space, but really on the physical particle, physical state that contains two states. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Maybe that's also some observable when could define. Maybe that's right, 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 right. So the Shakta says that if you just compute this in uh, ADS, you get a good observable just bang on, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's great. Right. That's, that's the case. And now what is the flat space? So then you would say that there are more, we can compute more things here right. than we could naively compute in flat space. Right, right, right. What is the flat space yes. that limited this? <coughs> yeah, uh, what, what about flat space string theory are we computing? When we compute, maybe what job was maybe uh, that on the branch cut, mm. you're kind of taking the, I mean the analog of the residue would have been, it would have been something the imaginary part, the, imaginary part uh, the discontinuity across, but that normally doesn't have a meaning. I mean yeah, it, yeah. it gives you some phase space, uh, two particle phase space density. Yeah, yeah, maybe one and one possible answer is that, as that Rajesh just said, like uh, maybe it's just included in the two particle state because the full Hilbert space of flat space, like a gra quantum gravity, is supposed to be like a multi-particle like graviton state. So, so one possibility is that it, like uh, this kind of like uh, non-BPS states, which couples to say two gravitons, maybe it just included in the flat space as the two particle. Right. What is, the, what, what is the computation you would do in flat space with that would give you this answer? Right. In flat space, let, do, we do, do, do we know of anything other than stable S matrices that we can compute? Right. It could be something like you start with a stable S matrix with more particles, and then you take two of these particles and you somehow fuse them, I don't know, give the same moment or something, so that you create this effective operator that corresponds to two particles. It feels that it's something like that. What is the precise formula? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To work out. Excellent. Sounds, I mean, but that for the S matrix bootstrap, it would be wonderful if you can somehow extract information from higher scattering amplitudes with more particles and 
reduce it to two particles, two to two, which is what we can work with in practice, that would be very good if we could uh, make that precise. So, so I think the question is very useful in practice. And, uh, uh, and I see. And you said that these are, right? Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering whether there was independent information in this that was not there in the S matrix system, a stable particle. You can say you scatter many stable particles, and then of course every all the information. That sounds great. Sounds great. Okay. Uh, thank you. So we got part, at least part of an answer to question number one. Let's move on to question number two. Okay, so this, the uh, the 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 second question goes as follows. The second question is uh, about about the large n limit. Is there a is over there? Yes. And there's even the water for those brave. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So question number two is about the large n limit. Um, let's get this up. Bottom. Yeah. Okay. Question number two is about the large end limit. Uh, and finite, you know, finite end improvement. Context of this question, uh, part of the, the background of this question, are uh, these recent discussions by Witten, Hartman, and collaborators, various various groups of people, uh, trying to explore what it means uh, to take the large n limit uh, of a quantum field theory in uh, the context of uh, or in the context of uh, uh, operators or states with dimensions of order e to the power. Of, of, of energies of order n squared. Okay, so let me remind you of, of the question of, of some of these discussions that people have been having, and then I will try to pose my question. Okay, uh, in this paper by Whitman but and many others, um, one could uh, one, uh, the the following or a version of the following question was brought up. Okay, suppose. I, I'm interested in taking the large n limit of, let's say, ADS5 times S5. Okay? The question is, what does this mean? So, when we take the large n limit, um, <coughs> we take the large n limit of some quantities that have a good large n. Let's stay fixed in the large n limits, because they said so. So, for instance, if we want to, we want to compute the uh, correlators of single trace operators. Since the spectrum of single trace operators has a nice large end limit, this is a very, 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 very posed question. Or if we want to compute the spectrum of the theory. Uh, and energy is of order one. And energy is of order one, whereas n goes to infinity, we expect that to have a good large end limit. So this is again a very good question. Now you could ask the question. What if I wanted to compute the spectrum of the theory? Uh, okay, at energies of order n squared. Okay, what do we know about the answer to this question? Well, we know that we expect this uh, the spectrum to have. Uh, that, that, that we know that we expect the density of states of these energies to go as follows. Rho of E, so suppose I take E is equal to alpha times n square, then we expect rho of E to be equal to E to the power something, uh, let's say n square times some function of alpha. Right? 
This is the statement that the entropy is also over n squared when the energy is over n squared. Okay. So rho is the entropy. Sorry? Rho is the entropy. Rho is the density of states. Oh, rho is the density of states. Okay. Right. So we expect this behavior. And uh, um, Witten and others point out in their recent discussions that uh, um, while something stays fixed, we expect in the large end limit, it's not, the, it's not the density of states itself. It's the density of states after we multiply by n squared. Okay. Now, this is, of course, very dramatic. Right? It tells you that the spectrum is far from fixed uh, at these energies as n goes to infinity. For instance, if uh, n is changed from a billion to a billion plus one, there's a huge change in the number of states uh, in a given band of Okay. So, while we might reasonably expect, um, uh, while we might reasonably expect to be able to compute f of alpha in some, uh, you know, averaged in some, some some way, the question of actually computing the in, the spectrum at large n uh, already feels like sort of a minus question. <clears throat> okay, and. Uh, um, <coughs> So these discussions by Witten and others propose that when we're working for such questions at large n, what we're effectively doing is some sort of averaging over large enough values of n. And that would give us some sort of continuum kind of spectrum, uh, the kind of thing that people talk about when they do this, uh, uh, when they do this, uh, uh, the, the SYK stuff, right. The kind of thing that people talk about when they, they do ensemble average. Okay. So this, 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 this was the suggestion. Okay, so now, assuming that this sounds very reasonable to me, uh, now assuming that something like this is true, one could then ask, okay, suppose we were trying to do ABS CFT at very large, but fixed to very large value of A. So that we have a um, definite theory with a definite value. Okay, um, to what extent does Gravity get that definite spectrum. Can gravity get the definite spectrum? Correct. Is gravity somehow limited to being uh, smoothing? Or can it actually, you know, some version of it, can it actually get the n equals 1 billion theory spectrum right in principle? To make this question precise, I'm going to remind you of something. Um, okay. The, the thing I wanted to remind you of was the following. If we wanted to compute the correlation function, uh, sorry, this partition function of this theory in n equals 4 n minus theory, and we wanted to set up an acid and do it at weak coupling, this calculation has been, the structure of this, this calculation has been done, the structure of the answer to this question is known, and we know that what we get is something of the form du exponential of uh, uh, some action, some action, so that's of the form n squared times some trace u by n, trace u by n, some uh, action built out of these objects. Okay, so you get an action built out of some function of these guys. Okay, if you just sit and compute in free angles or in weakly interacting theory, the angle theory, you compute the partition function. Uh, the partition function is computed as a function of the holonomy uh, of the gauge field around the time circle. That holonomy is u, it's a unitary matrix u. And uh, when you do the computation, you get some, some object like this. Okay? Now, when, uh, uh, when you actually take this object and try to evaluate it in the large n limit, what you do is to trade u for a density of states, for a density of uh, eigenvalues. Okay, you work with this rho of alpha, which is sum over delta of alpha minus alpha i divided by n. Okay, and you get this nice continuum. Uh, uh, you get this nice continuum function rho. Okay, so it's, and then you can go, you know, some distance in solving this uh, this integral in this large n limit. Uh, at lowest order in the large n limit, you extremize this functional row with respect to all smooth functions, 
And then at uh, sublating orders of the large n limit, you can do path integrals in row around this point. Okay. Um, so, so a question is this que this answer here is hundred percent precise. It's exact. Once you approximate it by some continuum kind of guy, okay, um, one can certainly produce the leading order large limit. Okay, and one can also produce various uh, one over n corrections. One of our papers we produce the first one over n correction. Okay, but uh, uh, so the uh, so now. It feels to me that roughly um, the, um, the analog of working with at least crude gravity is working with these continuum functions of rope. And the analog of being a finite end is working with this, you know, with the eigenvalues themselves. Okay? So a uh, question that I wanted to pose now is the following. Mm. Question number two is the following. Um, if one takes the unitary matrix model, uh, take the unitary matrix model, and uh, approximate it by a continue, by, uh, work with continuum row. <clears throat> Okay, and then first, very sub parts of this question. One question, one sub part of the question is, how far can you go working with this continuum row to approximating the actual, actual answer? How much of the answer can you produce? <laughs> what? This is, this is relatively known, right? I mean, in some cases. Uh, yeah, please, please say. I mean, you, you, can, you, you can actually, uh, I mean, what you find is that, you know, the, the one over n expansion, you know, but you're working with continuum row essentially means working all the orders of one the over n expansion. And then what about each and of the And then there are, there are exponentially small corrections, and then if you put them together correctly, then you get the exact answer. So the exact answer is obtained just by, by, by adding exponentially small corrections e to the minus n. But that's, that's maybe not always the case, at least in this case. Of, the, uh, these are some... Uh, we, we bought case here. Like instant on eigenvalue tunneling and things like that, you can't really. Uh, so, so you get some of the, some of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, you can, I mean, eventually you can get the exact original yeah. answer, even for n equal to 2, say, by doing this. But, but you can also rewrite this matrix integral exactly in terms of the path integral of rho if you introduce some auxiliary uh, <coughs> Lagrange multipliers. By, by basically making the very, where the eigenvalues are, zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yes. But that sounds like exact rewriting. Sounds like an exact rewriting, but then it won't be a continuum function. Mm. Well, but, sorry, but like, a, uh, I'm not sure like if you're talking about the same thing, but if you introduce an extra variable, like a not just row, mm -hmm. then you can rewrite it, right? So like, a, uh, please tell me. So, so essentially like you first like go to the eigenvalue basis of U integral. That's right. just like a bunch of eigenvalues. Alpha one to alpha n. And then uh, you just like uh, insert uh, one. Uh, one equals pass integral of d rho. Uh, and delta function of rho mm -hmm. minus uh, one over n. Mm -hmm. One over n. Oh, yeah, delta function. The argument of the delta function is like rho minus one over n. Uh, sum over. Oh, oh I see. Definition of rho. Put the definition of rho. The definition of rho. Yeah. So, and, yeah, and outside there is an integral, pass integral row, by the way. Yes, good. And then, because this is like a functional data function, you can also uh, rewrite it as an exponential. Yes. By introducing all the other variables. Lambda, lambda, yeah, right. You get lambda evaluated like uh, alpha i's. Right. So that becomes part of the potential for the matrix model. Okay. So you've got d lambda d rho. Yeah. Yes. 
And then like uh, you can rewrite the rest of the matrix integral uh, in terms of row because now uh, like a, alpha i because now we just like do the exact rewriting of rowing. Yes. And then uh, and the next step is to so there are like a, some, several other parts, which is essentially the potential of the original matrix model. Mm -hmm. but that part you, you can already rewrite as a like yeah, a, because it's all it's already yeah, wrong. Tracing, it's all gated yes. Right. And then uh, what you get is like uh, uh, now you see that like uh, after doing that, now you see that alpha i only shows up as a lambda of alpha i. Mm -hmm. and, and it's completely factorized. <laughs> Right. So suppose you had trace yeah. u to the n, trace u to the power minus n. Yeah, that, that you can already write it in terms of rows. Like row n, row yeah. minus n. Yeah. Uh, where this is Fourier, Fourier transform. Yeah. Okay. So suppose this. Was it. Okay. Good. Good. And then, like, uh, and then, like, uh, in the in the action you get now, if you look at which part of the action depends on alpha i. Then you see that actually alpha i only shows up in like a, a e to i lambda alpha i because you have e to i lambda alpha i times delta function. So if you do the alpha integral, you are going to evaluate lambda alpha i, lambda alpha at the position alpha i. Where I did not say that. Sorry. So, uh, so so we've got these. We've got yeah, these. yeah. So so that part is written purely in terms of rho. So yeah. let's forget about it. Yeah. But we still have that part, like uh, which we introduced because of the like, this multiplier, yeah. and yeah. that one depends on alpha i. Yes. 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 And then, but alpha i only shows up in e to al e to i lambda alpha because the first term, like uh, in the exponent, the first term is lambda times rho. That part doesn't depend on alpha i. Yes. And the only term that depends on alpha i is the one uh, which comes from the second term. Yes. But that term is very easy because like uh, alpha i dependence is completely factorized. Yes. So so actually you just have some like uh, some simple integral of d alpha e to i lambda alpha to the power n. Yes. And then you can imagine exponentiating it. So the action becomes a little bit non local. Mm -hmm. But at the cost of it you can do the exact rewriting. Well, but you know the question is what you calculate with this uh, with this. Yeah, but I mean, you know, I mean, you know, this kind of effective theories of densities, you know, eventually right. are not that useful to actually compute. Yeah, factors. I mean, that's my. I mean, even the perturbative I series agree. one over n is not so. I mean, this is very formal rewriting. But if you really want to calculate say, the partition function of the original matrix model, this is not so useful. I would say. Yeah, but but the question is like in principle whether we can get the final the exact answer from this. Yes, yes, but you see, this theory is going to have like uh, instantons, and then you know. But you were saying that like this in instant correction is not going to be included in this effective action. Yes, yes, sure, but you know it's kind of you know it's like you know you yeah. you, it's like an effective theory in which eventually you know I mean you're going to kind of calculate the instant correction, but you don't have to you can calculate the instant corrections independently. The question is what is I mean how you reconstruct the exact action starting okay, from okay. a one over yeah. n thing. Yeah. I mean yeah. the variables that you use, the formulas that you use, I think is like more like you know. I mean, these are like your artifacts of, of your of, of your model. But at the end of the day, your answer, if you want to write a one over n expansion, you know, the question is how much can you actually reproduce from the one over n expansion? And the answer is that, well, the one over n expansion is going to be factorially divergent. You have to resum it in some way, and eventually you will have to include exponentially small corrections. And, and, yeah, and, and then exactly. you, you get the exact answer. From yeah, that. Right, I understand. Well, so, yeah. and then, you know, the way you do it, you know, you can do it either in a model of eigenvalues entry or, you know, maybe with this, uh, with this kind of theories. I have to say that when I started working on instantons in matrix model, you know, these kind of effective theories of the densities were always very kind of hard to work with. Uh, at, the, at the end of the day, it's better to go to eigenvalues entry. At least that's, that's my experience. Okay, okay. Yeah, but, but, uh, yeah. but eventually you can reconstruct everything just up to exponentially small corrections if you want. Yeah, and uh, just addressing Chatra's question again, um, the question with three writers, privately path integral does do this thing. Right, yeah. right, yeah. Okay. Can one relate that row and so on to bulk observables? Yeah. In some so, so for instance, we know what these row ends are in gravity. They are the winding modes. Uh, we've got a thermal circle, and these are the winding modes of the n string. Okay. And uh, for instance, this rho n here has the property that this rho n, uh, that the nth, n plus, capital n plus one-th eigenvalue is not independent of the 
um, of the of the remaining ones. This is a finite n uh, artifact. Uh, whereas the gravity path integrity does not manifestly seem to say that. All of these n, n winding numbers are uh, in gravity look independent. Yeah, the n winding modes of the string. So I uh, okay. I take your point. There is some formal way of rewriting it um, exactly in terms of variables. But I think the interesting question is: Can one do it in a way that links to gravity? Yeah. Okay. Can one take this and rewrite it in a way that um, you know? maps to the gravity path integral and teaches us how to make gravity finite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, <laughs> it, 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 there was this particular case with the half BPS states that uh, uh, Atish and collaborators had, through a localization argument, tried to argue that you get all the finite n effects. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it was a localization argument. A localization argument. It's very but, specific, but very BPS. Very BPS, and yes. uh, but it sort of was encouraging in that direction. Yeah. So it would be really cool if one, you know, one could could do this. But what do we have? What do we have to do on the gravity side to do it? Right. For gravity would have to know that these know about these trace relations between these winding modes. Right. How is that put into gravity? Can we actually learn something about what the string theory path integral means from, from what we know about gauge theory here? Well, you will need non-trivial saddles in the gravity thing. What? Non-trivial saddle points in the gravity thing. Non-trivial saddle points. That's, that's clearly, that's, I mean, if you take these unitary models, you know, that's clearly the case. So, good. Remember that these, these are the models that have this kind of gross width and value transition. And so right. So let's say... So the gross width and value transition are actually triggered by these instantons. So, for example, you know, if you want to, you know, that's actually the, the microscopic mechanism behind this transition. It's like this proliferation of these exponential saddles. So. Okay, so suppose we are in a situation where we know that the gross button value of potential is something like this. Right. Oh, let's say something like this. So there are three saddle points. Okay, this is like the terminal ADS saddle point. This is sort of like the big, uh, small black hole saddle point. And this is the big black hole saddle point. Okay. All of them have analogs in the world. We know the saddle points. That's the big black hole, that's the small black hole, that's thermal ADS. Still, how do we go from there to getting this, uh, uh, this finite kind of structure, this discrete mm -hmm. Right? These are black hole type saddles, how does that happen? Uh, maybe you have different saddle points in mind? Mm, yeah, I mean, I was thinking more about the original, the original gross width and value model, just but, with two saddle points. Yeah, but you but know, this, this is, is this is slightly more complicated. More complicated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's that, double trace. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but you know, the saddle points are under control because they're large end features. Saddle points on both yeah. sides yeah. are under great control, even on the on on the bulk side. But you know, the saddle points are like saddle points for the for the continuum probe business. Yeah. It doesn't seem the discretization. Mm -hmm. So you were, you were suggesting maybe we need something like more deep brain, like something like that. Something. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Is that what you were saying, Marcos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. This, this, yeah. this, this, this like eigenvalue tunneling is supposed yeah, to be related to deep brains, right? So we should need some sort of. I mean, you should, in a sense, I mean, you you can think about the black holes that are made out of deep brains, and then you should kind of, you know, take out one of these deep brains that make out the black hole, and then you know, move it around, you know, and just put it in the other side and things like that. Perfect, perfect. That, that's really the kind of picture that you would get from some sort of eigenvalue tunneling. Perfect. So, so then the question would be, can you make an improvement of string perturbation theory that reduces the string perturbation theory at large n? Yes. That is this, yes, yes. but includes all this, and then basically produces the unitary matrix integral, yes. but with n eigenvalues. Yes, yes, yes. OK? I think if one could answer this question, one would learn a fair amount about, yeah. about string theory. But the question I think was that you know people were thinking that you need more kind of more general. I mean because these are exponentially small correct e to the minus n. I think people were saying that you need e to the minus n square type of corrections, right? Mm -hmm. And that's that's not something that appears in kind of simple matrix models uh, of this. I mean in the unitary matrix model you you wouldn't need e to the minus n square correction. And yet this e to the minus n will be enough to reconstruct the finite n. Okay, great. So you're saying that just work with the rates? Yes. 
and that will give you the full answer. Sorry. Exactly. Yeah. And maybe because the deep brains trap flux, yeah. you can't put more than it. Yeah. Because you take, it's like this giant gravity object. Mm -hmm. That you take n of them away, yes. and there's no space time left inside. Okay, great. Sorry, so I'm actually a little bit confused about yeah. one thing. So, so in the recent discussion about the spectral form factor, so like a, there is a, like a decay and yes. a and plateau. Yes. And so the spectrum really is corresponds to plateau part. The spectrum. Yes. The ramp is basically like eigenvalue repulsion, and the yes. plateau is yes. really yes. coming from yes. the. Uh, yes. But that plateau is typically like a doubly exponential effects. Like yes. So does it mean that we actually need something like doubly exponential also in general, like a large M series? A doubly exponential in what? E to the e to the minus n. Yeah, e to e to minus e to e to minus yeah e to minus e to the n. N square. N square. N square. N square. N square. N square. E to minus e to n square. Hmm. E to the minus e to the n square. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. I guess like it's hard to cook up any matrix model which has this effect. <laughs> yeah. But you know, exactly this matrix model should have that effect. Yeah, but if you go to like a finite, finite, finite time. Time. yeah, finite of coupling or fine. Yeah. Finite cou uh, coupling and maybe with a finite time. Yeah, yeah. Just some this matrix model or some version of it captures thermal physics exactly. So it should be powerful. It's a very simple thing. It's just one unitary matrix. It's not thing. So quantum um, can actually do something. Mm. Right. Yeah, excellent. Very interesting question. Okay. So uh, the, there's a way of writing this matrix model which one I had played with, which you can write in terms of sort of free fermions. Uh, I remember your yeah. Uh, 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 and then I, I, I think a free fermion recasting of this, I think captures the finite end effects because of the just the fermionic nature of this. Uh, sort of, you get this droplet kind of picture. You, you, effectively, it's one in which you include both the eigenvalues and the corresponding characters. In You can write it as a sum of representations of UN, and then the characters play the role of momentum, whereas the eigenvalues play the role of positions. And then you have a fermionic phase space, which in which you could have different uh, droplets which uh, seem to capture, it seemed to be very much like this LLM picture that was there for BPS states, uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Saying that each fermion basically corresponds to like a, something like deep brains because they yeah yeah. yeah so I think that's what uh, it's I think that kind of uh, uh, so maybe maybe uh, some phase space you can produce with some sort of quantum mechanics uh, uh, non commutative products go very well with phase space. I mean, is the suggesting somehow that some that's geometry is uh, uh, more. Mm. Uh, uh, this thing, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you want something in the continuum geometry which will which, capture that. It captures this element. Uh, the discreteness. So non commutative element, maybe. Yeah. It's Moyal product. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. okay. Let me go on because I am. Try <laughs> questions. <laughs> I had <a> more <laughs> questions. <laughs> okay. Let's let's keep going. Okay. Now, uh, just a, a sub part of this question, which is much vaguer, but. In my mind also, to my mind also interesting, um, goes this way. Yeah, uh, this is really more a comment than a question, which, okay, hey, anyway, let, me, let me just make it. When, uh, when we look at finite, since we're talking about that, when we look at finite temperature dynamics in these Yang series, we know that along the wavelengths, the finite temperature dynamics becomes a matter of finite dynamics. Okay? So, we have a sort of rule, which is gravity at long wavelengths is hydrodynamic. Okay. Now you can ask, what about gravity at not so long wavelengths, but still classical gravity, in the presence of black holes? Okay. So what is the analog of that? Uh, if you know long wavelengths is like hydrodynamics, what is gravity without the long wavelength? And I think there's a clear. Uh, 
a clear, uh, at least at the level of language, a clear analogy, which is this. Suppose you, we were interested in some sort of, um, in some sort of weakly coupled the angles theory, and, but we wanted to work in some large n uh, limit where this, the number of particles in our theory was very large. That would be true at large n because we have n square particles. Um, finite temperature dynamics is governed by an effective Boltzmann transport type equation. Okay, at uh, weak coupling, this is true, and people have, you know, you can work out the coefficients of this Boltzmann transport equation. Okay, now this connection between both, the connection between Boltzmann transport and hydrodynamics goes as follows. If you take the Boltzmann transport equation and let it be locally thermalized, but let the parameters of thermalization vary as you move around, you plug that into the transport equation, out come the Navier's equation. Okay, so Boltzmann transport, and you do long wavelength. Wavelength, you get hydrodynamics. Okay, so it's very similar to what we get what we get from classical gravity. Classical gravity and long wavelength gives us hydrodynamics. Okay, uh, so it feels like both the, in some vague conceptual way, all of gravity in the presence, classical gravity in the presence of uh, of the black frames are like the Boltzmann transport equations. Now the Boltzmann transport equations are equations for densities of particles. Number of particles is a function of position and moment. Okay? Whereas well, the true microscopic description is in terms of the globules, right? Okay? So this question sort of has the feeling of, I, in this context, is there a way of quantizing the Boltzmann transport equations and getting the gluons out? Um, uh, it's a question one can ask just directly in field theory, if one can make sense of this. Uh, clearly one can go from the gluons to the Boltzmann transport equations. Is there some sense in which one can, you know, undo the large ending of that uh, in some other way? This is so vague, I've left it just as a little comment on this question. But I feel it's in the same ballpark of ideas. Once again, it's a question of how you start with some continuum time description in this case, Boltzmann transport, and go from that to something discrete. Is there a clear toy model in which one can do this in some quantum field theory? I think that would be, uh, that might be just a lesson. But, but so you, is, in this analogy, can you actually make it precise that gravity is like a Boltzmann? Well, I can tell you to, to what extent it, you can make. It's big, because Boltzmann transport is not precise at strong coupling. Because Boltzmann transport is in terms of particles that have to live long enough to scatter in order to make that thing. And gravity is you know, where these particles are not very well lit. Right. So, but, but, so it's at the level of an analogy. It's like, a, uh, it's like a, you know, going from weak to strong coupling. But the, the precise thing is the following. That you see, well, a precise thing is the following. If you take the uh, Boltzmann transport equation and linearize it around equilibrium, around full equilibrium, OK? Then you get I, I did six for the Boltzmann transport uh, operator. Okay, the lowest energy eigenstates, okay, are hydrodynamics. Eigenstates, what we imagine in a moment, okay. energy is right. The lowest energy operators are the hydrodynamics, but then in the nation, they're all the higher harmonics. And gravity has precisely that feature. The higher harmonics are the quasi ones. So it feels quite like that. And really, fluid gravity can be thought of as integrating out the higher harmonics and getting an effective nonlinear theory to the lowest harmonics. Similarly, in Boltzmann transport, you can think of Boltzmann hydrodynamics as integrating on the higher harmonics and give. So that level of field quite similar. Okay. Excellent. Other questions? Comments? Excellent. Let me move on. Okay. Um, fine. Um, One more question about large n. Um, this time about uh, this time about going from field theory to gravity. Okay. Um, the question goes as follows. We know of many examples of uh, we know many examples of quantum field theories. Okay, which are apparently very different quantum field theories. 
but are governed by the same bulk effective action in a particular limit. So, for example, there's the theory on the world volume of M2 brains, and there's the theory on the world volume of M5 brains, but in the large N limit, both of them are governed by the, uh, by the action uh, 11 dimension, super action. Okay. Or there are zillions of examples in four dimensions of different quantum field theories, all of which in an appropriate large radius limit become type to be super gravity, or type to be string theory. Um, the question is to understand, so, uh, from the point of view of the bulk, we have some understanding of this. From the point of view of the boundary, this feels like a mystery. Okay? So, uh, the observation is the following. The observation is that there is a certain universality. Uh, in large n, large radius please, more than you would expect you do some funny operations and two apparently very different large n, large r CFTs and you get the same answer and the question is why so just to put some meat on this um, large radius here, you mean large tooth coupling? Large tooth coupling, that's correct. But shouldn't it be more <laughs> for the reasons of your first question? I mean, in the sense that if the flat space limit is the is also universal in, right? Exactly, that's why there's this universal. Right, but the flat space limit can be taken not just in the tooth coupling, I mean, ah, ah, yeah, yeah, sorry, you're right. You're, as long as you, you're right, just even the large n limit, even at fixed g, will have this universality. Correct. The, the large n limit, even at fixed. The, the large radius is not all that's needed. Yeah, absolutely right. Okay, so the question goes, so the, the question is, try, is to try to understand this. Well, you know, some of this universality. Um, you know, if you get into, if you have an example where some compact manifold stays fixed, these examples are hard to come by, but maybe in ADS3, then it won't be so universal away, f away from classical. What? Uh, if you keep the um, um, compact? If there is a large ADS but a finite compact uh -huh. dimension, mm -hmm. then the quantum theory mm -hmm. will start seeing the compact dimension. Correct. Okay. Uh, so you, the, if, if you're landed in such a situation, it won't be as universal once you take into account loops as it would be classically. Uh, but you're right, in many examples it's very universal, even even mm -hmm. uh, Okay, but so the question, so so uh, uh, just to put a, a little little meat out of this question. Um, first question you could ask, you know, the first question you could ask is why in the bulk did we get this huge universal? Why are the bulk theories always the same? And this somehow has to do with the fact that uh, bulk they are very rigid, appear to be very rigid. Um, at least in two different limits. And quantum mechanically, in maximal dimensions. Ten-dimensional string theory appears to be basically there's no other example. Okay, uh, let's look at the first first part of this first. Let's look at this classically in flat space. So this, you know, all of you know, if we take let's say type two theory, we put it on some sort of Calabi-Yau, and we've got R foil, then the graviton S matrices in this theory 
are basically, at classically, a universal independent of the details of this color beam. Okay. This fact follows just from the fact that driver on vertex operators belong to the R4 field theory and the fact that there are no moduli integrals uh, on X2 when, we, uh, on, when the genus that we are working on is, is the sphere. Right? So, even though we've got many different compactifications of string theory down to R4, these different compactifications of string theory don't translate into many different effective gravity theories of R4. There's this huge universality somehow uh, of classical of uh, classical theories of gravity in lower dimensions, which is not shared by the quantum, quantum counterparts. And then in maximal dimensions, there seems to be a very few known examples, even quantum mechanics. So I suppose one way of trying to address, in, uh, to address this question would be first understand why this works classically, and why this works in flat space. Okay? And then perhaps by formulating some sort of bootstrap problem for the flat space S matrix. And once you understood this uh, uh, in flat space, one could then try to formulate large N, large R. Uh, uh, well, one could then try to formulate large N, fini uh, finite R conformal field theories as some, by a sort of bootstrap, set of bootstrap equations, there are some sort of deformation of the bootstrap equations of the flat space S matrix. Okay. So maybe that's a definition somehow of these, uh, or, or, uh, of, these uh, uh, of these field theories. And you may have many, many different solutions at finite R, but all of which will then tend to this universal solution at large R, just because then your bootstrap equations will t tend to the bootstrap equations of flat space, which you will then have proved has very few, uh, very few solutions. I know this is a harder question than the ones I asked before, um, but uh, let me list it anyway. Question three is, question three is, In some cases, as Rajesh said, only large n. I'm writing the most, the case where it will always work. Okay? And sort of the suggested, suggested path is understand the universality in flat space by, by bootstrap. Um, formulate large n finite R theories by bootstrap equations that are deformation of these flat space bootstrap equations. Theories that has a, uh, a continuum large R limit has sort of been defined by a set of flat space S matrix at bootstrap uh, strapping solutions. Hey, any questions or comments or objections about this? Can you say a bit more about the first step? Like I understand the first this. step looks very hard already. So. This looks very hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What can I say about it? Um, 
You, you have in mind all these like these positivity constraints which were narrowing down the range in which you can have. Uh, <laughs> that, 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 I, but, but I think one should not look for inequalities for equalities. Yeah, but that's uh, harder. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, we what can do, it's it's uh, three levels, so you only have positivity. It's so people have. We have analyticity, positivity, crossing, and this has been explored. What, what are we missing? Uh, what are we, we just get inequalities in the Wilson coefficient? We don't get equality, so okay. we need to look at more than two to two. Yeah, or, or, maybe that's it. or maybe what we need to do is to put the other poles that appear also in, into the bootstrap. So that goes back to your first question. We need. But, we but need at the moment, I'm just at logic. So I'm classical. Everything's classical. But, uh, but we need to look at um, not just 2 to 2 scattering. 2 to 2 scattering or. Uh, or maybe 2 to 3 with some effective with the, way. With of other ways. 2 to 2. I think 2 to 2 should be enough if you include every external state at the outset. Okay? Sorry, yeah, I see what you mean. Because now they are absolutely stable. Yes. We don't have to solve that problem. Yeah. Yes. Okay? So I'm not saying this is an easy problem. Uh, so you have in mind, like in the Ising model, you try to narrow it to an island by including some more and more. Uh, Those small inequalities. I mean, I no, but uh, yeah, uh -huh. but uh, in any uh, any uh, finite process like that, you would narrow the inequalities down, right? Uh, where uh, where, uh, where else well, inequalities coming from? Uh, where, where, where could inequalities come? If well, I mean, if, if I did the bootstrap honestly for all the states, yes. it would be much, much more restrictive, right? Yeah. Bootstrap is always done by taking a very yeah. new set of constraints. Yeah, but uh, that is, of course, an infinite by infinite. That's infinite, 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 infinite. You just mean you just mean unitarity, or is there something else that I'm missing? No, it's uh, it's it's this, right? Yeah, it's that all of so if we're doing flat space, flat space, flat space scattering, it's that the Poles of um, that the poles of an S matrix are completely determined by the three uh, three particle couplings. Okay, so suppose we've got right. So suppose we've got and um, and that um, uh, and that polynomials are constrained by some energy energy type behaviors. Okay, so we could take an S matrix and expand it like this, sum over poles like this. Now we can take an S matrix and sum over poles like this. We should get the same answer. Okay, because of the, this sum over poles this way, sum over poles this way, should get the same answer. Here, I think looking at yes, and uh, this is a very tight problem because uh, the number of variables is much smaller than the number of equations because if the number of particles is n. Then the total number of equations is n to the 4, whereas the total number of variables is n to the 3. Because the three particle couplings is, for each three particles, you get an equation, uh, you get one coupling, but the total number of variables you have in your problem is n to the 4. So it feels like a very tight problem. So you say we've learned something about both theories of gravity from this? What? Have we learned that last year? Yes. Well, I mean, formulating this question was. An attempt to understand this question well, wasn't that the origin of string theory? This is Benetziano kind of. But let the string theory, this way of thinking. I'm not saying we learn anything concrete yet. You but, can do uh, tree level gravity what? that way. You can, do, you can do tree level gravity that way with just BCFW recursion. You have BCFW recursion, exactly. I, mean, it's, uh, uh, I don't know if that's enough for you to do tree level. I, I do, I'm only talking about tree level. I'm just trying to understand what you're asking. So you're not talking about 10 dimensions, you're talking about. Just general relativity in any dimension? Or? Any dimensions. Okay, so here. Um, suppose we take four dimensional gravity. I don't want to deviate you from. No, 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 but let's. let's. Yeah. Suppose we take four dimensional gravity. And we ask how many consistent, that is, by consistent I mean something that appears in a parametrically justified limit of string theory, yes. uh, uh, tree level S matrices of gravitons. Okay, so by consistent, I mean it, sh it should be con it should be possible to consistently truncate to tree level because of a parameter. Okay, so now we couple that. Uh, so there, the answer you know we could take many compactifications of string theory. Like we could take type two and let's say a Calabi many different Calabi Okay, 
Yet if we compute the tree level graviton S matrix. So just four dimensional gravitons. Four dimensional gravitons. They don't feel the Calabria. What? They don't feel the? They don't feel the Calabria. They don't feel the Calabria. Mm -hmm. Classically, you get the same answer for all of them. Yes. Quantum mechanically, you don't, right? Maybe I don't know what you mean by quantum mechanical. One loop. Yeah, so then it's not classical. Exactly. Okay, yeah. <laughs> 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 exactly. I'm trying to contrast what happens at tree level with. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at tree level, you see the same answer for all different compactifications. Yes. Uh, at one loop, you don't. Yes. Okay. So we've got zillions of different answers at loop level for graviton scattering. Yes. We've got only one answer, two answers at tree level. Yes. Okay. So it should be possible. That, so so there's. So because the, the number of answers is so small, you might hope that it's possible to get these answers just out of general consistency conditions. Unitarity, positivity, crossing, all of that. So the, so the first part of the problem is to do that. It's to show that you can form, to formulate a set of low energy constraints whose only solution you can show is three level Vera Soro Shapiro scattering in four dimensions. Okay. And then the <laughs> second part would be to generalize that to ADS. I agree that this is a different level right. of okay. complexity. Mm -hmm. No, the inequalities may not be such a bad thing. I mean, in the sense that they... <laughs> <laughs> in fact, move towards answering your second question. Uh, because, in a way, it's like no, the second, the second part three. No, no, sorry, the set part two of your two questions, right? So, in... Uh, the flat space limit is the extreme limit, but corrections to that are allowed, and you would get them by integrating out uh, these uh, uh, yeah. some finite la lambda. If I, I mean, yeah, the massive particles and and the inequalities are maybe kind of telling you how you could go away from. Okay. Uh, uh, from that, uh, this thing. Okay. okay. It could, could be. Let me. Right. Back, 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 back. But let me just to give it. I mean, you know, when, when Lee or whoever it was who classified Lee algebra. He's got a pan. He's got a pan, right? He or she had some very similar equations, right? <laughs> you know, you want to. Right, right. That's all the Jacobi yeah. identity. He and she didn't go around putting it on a computer and looking for new quality. Just solve it. Let's try right, to do it. Right. I, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I completely sympathize. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like there are like some alternatives of the restaurant which are kind of like a mix of the level of the whole gravity and And did people play that game like looking at the poles and try to consider scattering? Uh, nobody did, but I know the ones you're talking about. They almost certainly fail because they're these sick features, right? Mm -hmm. These accumulation points. Right, right, yeah. So they almost certainly. I've never seen anyone do it. I see. But I think intuitively it seems very likely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ah, uh, thanks. Since I've got six minutes left, I'll just go on and set up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, urgent. Uh, urgent questions. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, let me. I'm going to skip some of my questions. Uh, I'm going to skip some of my questions in the interest of time. Let me go on to this one. Some things we can even like when Matt comes and yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 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 it from Qubit. Uh, uh, okay, so so let's see. So we've got uh, people have made a. So the question is um, whether in contexts like n equals four and this theory, um, there are other weakly coupled descriptions of the theory than weakly coupled strings. Okay. So, of course, people have made a big deal of the fact that n equals 4 Yangman theory is a theory of strings. All of us have made a big deal of this from starting from Polya. I don't know where I thought. Uh, okay, but now, when, now because of ADS CFT, see, you could, now because of ADS CFT, um, there's a suggestion that there is another energy range of the theory. So, strings are a very good description for the theory. When the uh, when the theory is at energies of order one. Presumably, there's no good weakly coupled description of the theory 
when the theory said energy is about n squared. But there's some space between 1 and n squared. In particular, there are energies of order n. Okay? So we have E order n. Now, there are already some indications that interesting excitations in this, uh, in this regime are, are debrids. Right? That it's giant gravitons, new giant gravitons, and so on. So, it's very natural to, uh, to hope that one can make an effective bulk description of this theory um, as a theory of d Now notice that d rates continue to be weakly coupled. Okay? A little less weakly coupled than strings. But continue to be weakly coupled uh, at, uh, uh, simply because the coupling constant is governed by the open string coupling, gs, which is the square root of the closed string coupling, which was gs squared. So gs is very small, strings are very weakly coupled. d rates are less weakly coupled. Still weakly coupled. Okay? So, this, it feels like that at, at energies of order n, there should be a description of what's going on in terms of a theory of these rates. Now, this thing is interesting because, you know, in the 80s and so on, people tried very hard to generalize string theory by making uh, um, theories of membranes and so on. Uh, all of those never went anywhere. Let me ask you a question, yeah. Siraj. You know, just to give you, a, you know, this would be in QCD, this would be the uh, baryons, describing the sector of the, the baryon sector of the sea. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. And we know that there are some descriptions of baryons, right? Right. We weekly, weekly couple. couple. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Now, the kind of thing that one would ideally like would be to make this um, kind of map that we understand so well for closed strings. So map between um, operators and their fox space. Okay, so see single trace operators and their fox space. So do the same at the level of deep rays. So we've got some determinant, subdeterminant type operators and their fox space, which we should produce the whole spectrum. And then figure out the rules for the path and tail rules in the bulk by with for a fixed background geometry by integrating over D3 brains, brief D3 brain work. For instance, if we take some three giant graviton or four giant graviton operators and we want to compute their correlation functions, we should have some, let's, let's, I'm doing it for three, but there should be some sort of pants diagram, uh, pants diagram involving D3 brains. Uh, that, that and its fluctuations uh, should, be, should be applicable to this, this correlation. Now, this sounds like, a, again, very ambitious. But I, my suggestion is to work uh, in BPS sectors first, to try to get something concrete. For instance, uh, precisely for the, for, for, for this, for the, uh, for the case of uh, D3 brains, there is an interesting 1 8 BPS sector. Uh, one can define. And this 1 8 BPS sector, which I could tell you details about later if you're interested in, uh, goes as follows. Suppose you take an x1, okay, um, uh, plus you define a z alpha operator, which is x1 plus cos theta, cos alpha x2 plus sin alpha x3. That's it. X is at the, the six, six the six fields. Uh, dual complex. Yeah. So the normal definition of and there's an i here. Sorry. The normal definition of a z would be x1 plus i x2. Okay. So you have a complex structure that rotates uh, with alpha, and if you put operators made out of these z alphas, uh, so z alphas are BPS with respect to different uh, different supersymmetries. Now, if you put these insertions of these z alphas at points that are tuned to alpha. You can choose all of these insertions to be preserved by the same 1 8 BPS subset. Okay? So, in this situation, in the field theory, computing correlation functions of anything you want is very easy. It's a free field. It's a free package, yes. Are you talking about chiral algebra sector? What? Chiral algebra sector? No, this is a bit different from the Gatlin algebra. Okay, it's, it's probably a little bit simpler than. It's simpler than the Gatlin algebra. Yes, yeah. 
Yeah. Who's the one that uh, Drucker, Drucker and... Uh, Nadhav and, uh, and company and study. Okay, okay, so it's like a 1D version of chiral algebra. Something like that. Right. Okay. Um, so, in this sector, one can find pretty explicit relations for the uh, three-point functions, four-point functions of these, these insertions. And one can check that they have exactly the right scales to be reproduced by an action for the e to the power minus n times some uh, fixed scale. So, so the, the question is, can we actually do it? So the operators are determinants of this. Rule. Yes, you can build any operators if it's one out of these in the one one TPS. But to be interesting, you want to go to some determinants of these guys. OK? Um, you can get, uh, on the field theory side, very explicit answers. And the question is to try to reproduce this, to start with, from some you know, simple bulk diagram. And then generalize this to formulate some path integral of these bulk. So you, you want to write uh, bulk action, which is so like some uh, DBI-like action for uh, the D3 brain world volume? And Say at least, to, at least to start. For the supersymmetric thing, that should be. Yeah. Yes, to some extent, this was done by Davide, Davide Gayot in the Cairo algebra sector in, the, in his recent paper, like last year. The, the paper with the, the, the topological... Yeah, twisted holography. Just, uh, twisted holography. Twisted holography. Yes, to some extent. I mean, his, for, uh, his formulation is very abstract. Uh, are you talking about the index paper or the one No, no, not the index paper. Yeah, the one. The yeah. recent one. Yeah, right. Perhaps to some extent it's been, it's been done. The formulation is very, I mean, it's just thrown at you, right? What, what the bulk theory is. Yeah, well, it's like a deformed conical. Okay, fine. Yeah. You're satisfied with that? Yes. <laughs> 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 okay, okay yeah, you, you, want to, you want to show it from ADS5 to this slide? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Right, I, I'd like to see the D brains, I'd like to see them moving. No, he had a, he has, he had a spectral curve. He has a spectral curve, he has a mapping. I, 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 I know, but it, it. Okay, maybe I don't know the paper very well, but when, when I looked at it, yeah, then they have something like a DBI action. No, uh, well, because it's topological. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it's not yeah. corrected, so uh, yeah. you want to. Okay, you go from there to the DBI action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what, what, yeah, indeed, what, what he didn't do is to derive this like a uh, twisted model from the foo fu fu wedged string theory. Right, exactly. Yeah. And uh, the, the point is to use this to learn about non supersymmetric things. Right? I mean, you, you, I mean Shota did uh, the thing with these. Determinant operator, yeah. the non BPS uh, ones, right? Yeah, and, and, you, and like uh, the connection to the bulk action is a little bit obscure. So, right. so what David basically did the same analysis uh, as what we did, but he focused on BPS sector. And then in BPS sector, he could actually make direct connection with the bulk, like a topological DPI action. Right, 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 right. Excellent. So, my, um, my, my hope is that we will. Use this to learn of a new formulation of bulk physics, at least in some context, just not as a path integral over strings, but a path integral over some higher grades. Uh, this feels like something people tried and didn't work, and then people had reasons why it shouldn't work. But do you think that it will work quantum mechanically uh, as a full fledged? I mean, it's a. Well, if one, one should be able to compute one over n corrections to this. Yeah. Um, so that feels like a quantum mechanical. Well, um, one over n corrections. Do you have any? But, but there is also like a, you could imagine writing open string field theory right. 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 rather than like right. it's like a exactly. different as a fundamental degrees of freedom. Yes. Right. Maybe one could. Maybe yeah. Maybe one wants to do that. Uh, yeah. Actually, what seems complicated to me is when two D brains come together. Mm -hmm. It's because then you've got these new strings between the brains mm -hmm. that have to be somehow taken. Exactly, that's what the open string field theory would do. Yeah. Right. You would. So maybe you want to do that. Maybe you have to augment this, which is not just by, not just with, uh, with, with thing, but hopefully with not too many bells in this. Not too much. Right. Well, I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, but. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, maybe I'll say something in the afternoon when I, uh, <laughs> when I, when I uh, uh, yeah, in the interest of time, let, let me see. Yeah, uh, uh, one more comment about this. Uh, give me, it's five minutes more. Okay. <laughs> yeah, one more comment about this is that uh, the new guy paper, if it, okay, yeah, yeah, the yeah. index paper, 
may also have some input on this. You know, because I think that one, one way of trying to make, one way of getting data on this kind of thing is to, is if we knew the partition function of anything we saw in theory, and energy is of order n, that would give us information. But, you know, there's this fantastic superconformal index. That is, in some sense, a partition. Unfortunately, only for supersymmetric object, but okay. Um, uh, it's a partition function. And the recent progress of un uh, understanding the partition function should help us understand the density of states of the theory at order n. And maybe we will see, you know, does it look like a fox space? Fox space of what? Maybe that will help us. Yeah. So, for. Uh, Uh, just to remind you, in the old days, the most serious attempt that I'm aware of that was made for this kind of problem was for M2. Right? People tried to formulate it as, you know, strings are to string theory as M2 grains are to M theory. Uh, and that never worked, and then people came up with the reasons why it shouldn't work. And the main reason is that they're never weakly coupled. Right? That's basically the main reason. See, you, you can ne never separate one M2 grains from two from three. And, uh, uh, these three grains are weakly coupled in this domain, so something good should happen. Uh, I feel. I hope it's not so good, but so complicated that it's useless. If it's some open string theory, it sounds useless. Okay, let's. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, um, I will leave my. Uh, I'll leave my entanglement uh, information, it from qubit type questions to when, when Matt comes. Um, let me just go on to my last question and I'll stop. The last question is to generalize ADS it. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the question is, of course, very not very novel. Um, we understand string theory in asymptotically ADS spaces, and we understand that these are formulated as quantum field theories, as quantum field theories on the boundary great. Uh, and as zillions of people have said before, there are other highly symmetric spaces in string theory, two of which are flat space and, um, and, uh, uh, and de Sitter space. Okay? Uh, so, uh, the question is, can we somehow move beyond ADS after all these years to find some independently well-defined structure on some sort of boundary by flat space or, or the Seder space that plays the role that the conformal field theory plays um, in ADS theory? Now the question is, how do you do this? Right? Okay, so one, uh, one, one possibility is to try, since we don't have any good ideas, at least as of now, so as far as I can tell for the boundary. Uh, one possibility is to try to, um, uh, one possibility is to try to uh, study the bulk in as much, as much detail as possible. And uh, if you have some idea for what should play, you know, the role of correlation functions, the role that correlation functions plays in uh, uh, ADS, try to find equations for that quantity, but uh, constrain that quantity, and thereby try to find, uh, you know, thereby find mathematical equations that might help guide you towards finding what the what the what the uh, uh, what the structure is on the boundaries. So let me say two, three words about that. Uh, I'll stick to flat space, both because of time and because, in some sense, anyway, yeah, I'll stick to flat space, but uh, uh, also because. The people here who work on the sitter, so they, they can tell us more about the sitter. Uh, but um, uh, in flat space, as we've said before, 
there is a sort of close analogy between the asymmetric of flat space and action as a function of boundary values like in ABS. And I think one should try to make this as understand this as precisely as possible. Okay. So something one can un one can show is that A, something this that is well known, is that the S matrix in flat space is, is a boundary problem. It's a holographic problem. Right? By which I mean that if you could compute correlators, correlation functions on some boundary of space time, you have enough information from that to reconstruct the S matrix. Moreover, one can also show that, and it's equivalent to what I just said, that if you take flat space, you put some cutoff. So imagine that you take a cylinder in flat space. Okay, your cutoff is this surface, this surface, and the curved surface. Let's say to be simple, I'll send the curved surface off to infinity. So my, my surface is the two pillbox, the two cuts here. Okay. Um, or you could do the other way around. Doesn't matter. Um, uh, well, can, uh, but let's imagine that we've got these surfaces. Then you compute exactly what you compute in ADS. Namely, action as a function of boundary values. You have to define boundary values of what? In this case, on these surfaces, these would be boundary values of positive energy data here and negative energy data here. Okay, you compute that action as a function of boundary values. Uh, that, that is the yes. S matrix. Uh, and one can try to make this very, very precise. Okay, now, so this action as a function of boundary values here can be seriously related to the S matrix. Now the S matrix obeys an equation. That equation is unitary. Okay? So this gives you a nonlinear equation for the flat space analog of action as a function of boundary values. So maybe one can write that down. One can stare at it. One can see if one can find some sort of mathematical, some other mathematical structure that obeys that equation. I know this is a bit way out. Okay. So sorry, you, 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 you just talked about unitarity here, right? Yes. Okay. Just the equation of S S I does equal to one. Okay. That equation can be translated into an equation on its action as a function of boundary values from here. But you're not talking about it as you're normally used in terms of the singularities and worrying about residues and singularities and factorization properties. Ah, no, at the moment I was, to define the S matrix, I'll do some of that. Mm. You know, to relate the S matrix to this set of factor and polars and so on. Yeah, yeah. But once I've got the S matrix, there's just an abstract equation. Okay. Which is SS tag that's equal to 1. You know, could cost these rules. Mm -hmm. Two or others. That's some equation for this action as a function of boundary values. So you're talking about S matrix of gravitons. Uh, of gravitons, I could say the same for quantum field theory to start with. Yeah, uh, so what. Uh, you don't, I mean, no, yeah. you don't expect a holographic description for just a quantum. I mean, it, 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 it would some... be very similar to, you know, people do some discussions of these quantum field, you know, ADS-CFT without gravity. Mm -hmm. And much of it goes through, right? It's just that boundary theory doesn't have a stress sensor. Yeah. So it, it would be that kind of thing. It would be some baby version. If you did quantum field theory, it would be some baby version. But this baby version would have stress sensor, yeah, have gravity. So much of this is just like in ABS, you, you can do it, a lot of what you, can, what you do with real theories, you can do with theories without, you know, real bulk theories with gravity, you can also do without gravity. So, mm, okay. right. so, uh, so, so, so the question is to find equations. I mean, if this is the right object to look at in flat space, not so clear. But if this is the right, it's a natural object, which is the S matrix, very natural analog of this. You can formulate it in a sort of almost local way. You should be able to find some equations for it. At least unitarity is a clear equation. So but unitarity is an algebraic equation. You want some kind of differential equation? No. It would be great. But you also have symmetry equations, right? Hmm. Um, like in ADS, oh, right. in ADS, you have symmetry equations to implement SOD, comma two isometries. You will have some equations here implementing some of these flat space isometries. Well, you got the BMS group. You got the BMS group exactly. It's the kind of thing Strom and Jen friends try to use a lot. So, those will give you some sort of differential equations. But you know what I like about unitarity is it's nonlinear. Yeah. It's a beautiful nonlinear equation that somehow constrains this object. The question is to, I, I, mean, I think it would not be hard, and in fact, 
with some students I'm doing it, um, to, to, to write down, to make all these statements, I'm saying here very precise, to write, write down this equation. Then what do you do with the equation? Probably you'll end up doing nothing. But, uh, but, uh, but anyway, maybe get lucky. Maybe, maybe we have to search to be a little more creative than ADX. It's been 25 years. We need to go beyond, right? <laughs> So, uh, I mean, people like uh, Suvrat and all have been talking about uh, this in flat space holography at spatial infinity. Yeah, you could do that as well. Uh, yeah, right. And right. Is that complementary? I've never figured out what exactly they are, or what observables they are really kind of uh, uh, considering. Uh, in some, but in some ways, it sounded more closer to ADS-CFT than yes. to look at spatial infinity. Yes, yes. You know, there's a Euclidean version of this. You can, when you compute this action as a function of boundary values here, and then you go to Euclidean space, all you're doing is computing action as a function of boundary values. In Minkowski space, you compute the action as a function of boundary values problem is a slightly strange problem. Because you, you have to say what you mean by the boundary values. And in the past, you give negative energy, a positive energy later, and in the future, you give negative energy later. But when you analytically continue that in Euclidean space, it's really just the Dirichlet problem. Action as a function of boundary values. And once you're in Euclidean space, then all boundaries are the same. Right? So it feels closely related. But for, through this, at least through this Euclidean space. Um, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, why is it so. I, I, I mean, you, yeah, why is it so complicated to. Uh, uh, just take the lambda goes to zero limits of ADS-CFT. I mean, I, mean I, I know it is, and I know it's a horrible thing. I mean, why, why couldn't Andy just take all of your guys' results and uh, apply it to CS matrix? Well, I, I, what we can do is at the level of observables, of concrete correlation problems. You know, at the level of the theory itself, nobody has been able to do it so far. I mean, it's, it's the fact that correlation Functions aren't the same as an S matrix. I mean, they, 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 they um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's it that there is it, there's a very qualitative difference between what you calculate in both cases. So the, it's it's a it's a parametric limit that n is going to infinity at the same time as a kinematic limit that you have to focus correlation functions in some specific positions at the boundary of ADS, and uh, it's unclear what part of the path integral, say, of the original CFT you should use to compute precisely that limit. You, you basically, if you have the full correlation function, you can do it, but I don't know how to extract from the full path integral what computes this limit. That's one way of saying it. I mean. Okay, I'll end with one last, just one and a half minute comment about the zeta space limit. Stop. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Uh, uh, I was asking, uh, Zhao and Shota about this at breakfast, but you know, it seems to me that the zero space should also have some sort of S matrix from past to future. And uh, you might at first think that the S matrix, but so you might, you might at first think, and I think this is true, but you might at first think that the zero space, the S matrix is really good S matrix, by which I mean, you know, flat space, you find S matrices from a known inverse space to a non space, maybe free particles, free particles. And you can do that because particles are separate. Okay, if, you've got, if you go here and you've got a one particle state and a two particle state here, the two particle state is a wave function for relative, relative motion and it dilates, right? But so the one <coughs> particle state does not, so you just you stare, that, stare at it long enough and it's just a one particle state. Okay, so, so that's how it works. That's nice. And at first you might think that in the space, this works even better. Because the zero space in late times and early times, space expands exponentially. It becomes even bigger than flat space. You might think you can get great stuff. But I think this is not true. I think this is not true for the following reason. You know, there's this famous thing that things freeze out in the zero space at late enough time. Okay? And this famous thing is simply the following thing that we know very well. If you take d eta squared plus dx squared by eta squared, okay, and you write down, uh, 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 you write, you solve the, sh the wave equation at small eta, the eta scaling becomes independent of what your x motion is doing at small enough eta, 
Right? This we know very well from ADS. It's the reason that local denormalization is so simple. No matter what you're doing in X, you get the same scale in, in eta. Now, this thing that I said about two particle states are smaller than one particle state because they dilute away comes about because the time dependence of the two particle state depends on k. Omega is a function of k. Right? That's what makes the six spread. But when that doesn't happen, when the eta dependence stops being a function of k, stops being sensitive to what your x is doing, that spread doesn't happen. So really, what you get is that by the time you reach some finite distance, and that distance is determined by what your size of your wave packet is. Okay, what well, the size of your wave packet is, the fact that it, the center space is expanding doesn't help you anymore. Because your, your wave packets freeze, and you expand with it. And all the correlations that you have from <coughs> here are just put in the deep freezer and kept. And indeed, yeah, that's CMB. And that's what we see in the CMB, exactly. It went through some very deep thing, it's all. Right? So, you know, there's some sort of scattering in the center space, I believe. But it's less good than flat space scattering. In the sense that it's not from a Fox space to a Fox space, really. It only becomes that in the limit where the particles, wave packets become very small. And uh, so, when we do this, of course, people look at other observables in this inner space, just one, one sided observables. Wave function of the universe, correlation functions, built out of these wave functions. But it seems to me that it's natural to look at this two sided guy because the study of unitarity would be very natural from this two sided guy because it's transition amplitude. And uh, it would be nice to understand the theory of scattering in the center space and to do the same thing in the center space that one can do in flat space. Okay, I'm, st I'm, I'm done. I'm sorry I went so far over time. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thanks very much for setting up.